Matthew chapter 26, please, in your Bible. We're making our way through the book of Matthew. Can I remind you that beginning in chapter 21, we're in 26 today, but beginning in chapter 21, we encounter Jesus' last week on earth prior to the cross. In the last three chapters of the book of Matthew, 26, 27, 28, 26 is a really a preparation for the crucifixion, for his suffering. All these three last chapters really center on the sufferings of the Lord. In chapter 26, we're not going to see this part of the chapter this uh, uh, today, but he's arrested and he's put on trial. We'll do that next week. Chapter 27, he's crucified. Chapter 28, he rises from the dead and uh, gives his final instructions, which are what we call the Great Commission, your memory verses. But that's the last three chapters. But the last week of Jesus' life, let me just quickly review it for you. He arrives in Bethany, goes to a man named Simon's home before sunset on Friday. He enjoys a uh, Shabbat meal with his friends and uh, yeah, I guess it's a dinner in his honor. And then the next day is Sunday and uh, he, in chapter 21, that entry into Jerusalem, remember where they're, they're, uh, they're throwing palm branches on the ground in front of him and they're saying, uh, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. His triumphal entry, they call it. Not really very triumphal as it turns out. After that, he returns back to Bethany. Monday, he goes back to Jerusalem. And on that day, remember there's the cursing of the fig tree. He uh, enters the temple and he cleanses it. He cleanses the temple. He, re he then returns to that cleansed temple on Tuesday. And chapter 21, 22, and 23, he's met by opposition. As he's teaching in the temple, those three chapters, he's opposed by the religious leaders. Later on Tuesday, he goes up on the side of the Mount of Olives, and he delivers what we call the Olivet Discourse that we've looked at, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. And in those chapters, he answers two of the disciples' questions what, uh, when will the end of the world be and the sign of his coming? And then he, notice this, he reminds the disciples in verse 2 of chapter 26. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, and I take that to mean the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 25. When he had finished these sayings, he said to his disciples, verse 2, you know, after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So he reminds them, we have a Seder coming up. We have a Passover Seder meal coming up in two days. And uh, I think he was referring to Thursday, that evening, that they would have that Seder, that uh, Passover meal together, because the next day, Friday, he would be crucified. He also reveals the fact that there's a plot to betray him. And he develops that a little bit more in verses 3 to 5. Look, then assembled together the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people, under the palace of the high priest, which was called Caiaphas. And they consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. We don't want to cause a riot. So, he knows what's ahead. He informs the disciples, there's a plot in which I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be crucified. But the passage that I want to look at this morning is the rest down to verse 30, 
we'll pick up with verse 6 and go down to verse 30 as quickly as we possibly can. And what you're going to encounter in those verses is really two separate meals. There's two separate meals. There is uh, a meal in Simon's house, which is pictured for us in verses 6 through 13. And it was paralleled in John chapter 12, which we read in our scripture reading this morning for a purpose. And then there is that Passover Seder, that meal that is in uh, verses, um, I think, uh, 14 down to verse 30. Something like that. Something similar. 1 to 16, 17 to 30. That's how it's broken up, actually. So my desire this morning is for us to consider the deal in the meal. What do I mean, with, what, what do I mean by that? In both of these meals, there's a deal going on. And the deal centers around Jesus and Judas. And I want you to see that with me after we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to get together and to open the Bible this morning. And I pray that you will use your word in every single life. You have something for every one of us here. And you know and you can make your word tailored to the spiritual need of our heart. And we're asking, Spirit of God, that you would do just that. We're praying, Lord Jesus, that the Spirit of God would reveal you in our midst and that uh, you would be here and thus our meeting would be worthwhile. We pray that you would have your way and that you would receive all the glory and not men. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, the first meal is really the first 16 verses, and uh, it's a contrast between worship versus waste. Worship versus waste. And it's the story of Jesus being in Simon's house for this meal in his honor, and how Mary comes and she anoints his, actually his head and his feet, with this very expensive perfume. And Judas is the one that speaks up, and the other disciples then follow his lead. Judas speaks up, as John tells us in the 12th chapter, and says, what a waste! What a waste of expensive perfume! To pour it on Jesus' feet? It's a waste. So what you have here is a contrast in the first meal. Here's the deal. Worship versus waste. I want to think about that with you. Uh, when we look at this particular meal in Simon's that are at that, uh, that dinner meal with Jesus, but the account here in Matthew's Gospel focuses in on three people. It does also in John's account. And those three people are Mary, Judas, and Jesus. Let's look at them separately as we begin. Pick up with me in verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he had healed this man of leprosy. Verse 7, there came unto him a woman. We know that woman from John 12 to be Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. A woman came having an alabaster box, that is, some type of a container made out of uh, stone, alabaster stone. It, pro it was a box, it was a, a, what we would call a bottle or a vase, whatever. She had this alabaster box of very precious ointment, very expensive perfume. And she poured it upon the head of Jesus as he sat at the meal table. Now, they're sitting on the floor. They didn't sit on chairs like we do. The table was only about this far off the floor. They sat on pillows on the floor. And uh, they leaned on their, left, uh, on their left arm. They leaned to the left. And so that, that will be important as we go on here. But, of course, when you're sitting like that, uh, your feet are behind you. And so she comes up behind him, this Mary does, and she anoints his feet. Now, listen to me. Mary appears in the scripture, this Mary, 
about three separate times. And what's amazing is every time she appears in the Bible, she's at Jesus' feet. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. She's at Jesus' feet. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus is in the house of Martha, her sister, and Mary, and she is sitting at Jesus' feet listening to his instruction, listening to him teach the word of God. She's sitting at his feet uh, as a listener, as a learner, and she's found that to be a place of rich spiritual blessing. In John chapter 11, when her brother Lazarus dies, and Jesus shows up, and they don't know it yet, but he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, she goes forth to meet Jesus, and again, she falls at his feet, and really just unburdens her heart at the feet of Jesus. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And she found the feet of Jesus not only a, pl a, a place of blessing, but a place of unburdening, a place that you throw your burdens down. Uh, you cast your cares upon the Lord, so to speak, at his feet. And then here we are, the third time, she's at the feet of Jesus, but now she's anointing his feet. She's honoring him by being at his feet and anointing his feet, of course, his head too. She's giving her best to the Lord. She found blessing at his feet. She laid her burden down at his feet. And now she gives her best at the feet of Jesus. She anoints his, his head first and his feet. In other words, from head to toe. It was really symbolic of the anointing of his entire body, head and foot. And she does that and then wipes his feet with her hair. She lets her hair down and uses her hair as a towel to wipe his feet off. I don't know if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 15, but it tells us something. It tells us that the hair of a woman is a symbol of her glory. And so you might say that in essence, she surrendered her glory to the Lord. And it was an act of worship. It was an act of love. And when she did so, the Bible tells us that the whole room was filled with the, the fragrance of that expensive perfume that she had poured out in total upon his head and his feet. And she gets rebuked for this, of course. But Jesus clears something up here, and I just want to quickly uh, drop down for a moment. Verse 12 she hath poured this ointment on my body, and she did it for my burial. Listen, how did she know? <laughs> because she had been at his feet, and she had been listening very carefully to his teaching. And she, she understood, she had insight that even his disciples didn't have. Because she had listened to Jesus' word carefully, she knew that he was going to die very soon, that he was going to be buried, and uh, that it wouldn't require the necessary traditional anointing of the body after death because she knew the scriptures. Psalm 16.10 says that the Messiah's body would not rot, that the Lord would not allow his Messiah to have his body suffer corruption. And so there would not to be there would not be a need for the typical and traditional anointing of the body. She recognized the teaching of the Lord, had that insight, and so she was the only person that was ever able to anoint the body of the Lord prior to his death. Everyone else that tried to missed the opportunity of anointing Jesus' body. Think about that. Those women that had those spices, they came to the tomb, but it was too late. He had already risen. Point being, if you are going to worship the Lord, you better do it now instead of later. 
Whatever God has laid upon your heart to do, now's the time to get it done. Now's the time to follow through. Now's the time to worship the Lord. And what she is doing here really is unrestrained worship. I mean, she's not holding back anything at all. It's unrestrained worship. The time for unrestrained worship is right now, folks, because you may not have an opportunity again to ever do that in your worship of the Lord. So that's Mary. Let's look at Judas. We'll pick up in verse 8 of, of Matthew 26. But when the disciples, and we know from John's gospel that Judas was the spokesman. He's the one that was most put out by this, saw it. They had indignation. And they said, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Judas says it this way. In John 12, Judas says, what a waste. You could have sold this, uh, this, this expensive perfume for 300 denarii. That is, you could have sold it for a year's wages. What do you make a year? What do you gross a year? That's the worth of this expensive perfume. Imagine that. Judas... He sees it as a big waste. The twelve, they agreed with him. They weren't very spiritual either. But did you notice how Judas tried to make himself sound spiritual? Why, this shouldn't have been poured out on Jesus' feet. This should have been sold and we could have helped many people with this. Jesus didn't buy into that fake spirituality. Not at all. We'll see that in a moment. But he tried to come off as sounding spiritual. And uh, he's really not spiritual. He's really a fake. He's a fake believer. He's not even a real believer. He's a plant. He's not genuine. And God gives him, Jesus gives him a warning over and over again, even before this. And this guy is the waster. He wastes opportunity after opportunity to get right with God. God gives people so many opportunities to get it right. God gives us opportunity after opportunity to get right with Him, to come into a right relationship with Him. Judas never did until it was too late. He ended up committing suicide, as we know. But he was warned and he wasted opportunity to be saved. Don't waste opportunities that God affords you. Whether it be to be saved or to get things right with God in your life. Take the warning. Take the admonition. Take the challenge from the, and the conviction from the Spirit of God and act on it. Don't wait and waste as Judas did such opportunity. You know what's happening in this guy? He was disappointed with God. He was disappointed with the Messiah. He, like many other of the Jewish people of his day, wanted a political deliverer. He wanted a Messiah that would deliver Israel from Roman oppression and Roman domination. He wanted to overthrow the Roman government that was uh, now in place there in Israel and Judea in particular. He wanted to do away with Roman oppression. And Jesus disappointed him. Jesus disappointed him because that's not what he came to do the first time. He came to give his life a ransom. He came to seek and to save that which was lost in his first coming. And that really disappointed. And you know what happened? That disappointment grew into despising Jesus. Be warned. Be very careful about becoming disappointed with the work of God in your life. Because if you're not careful, you'll, you, you, without realizing it, that disappointment can quickly turn to despising. 
And that's what happened with this man, Judas. He became a despiser of the Messiah. And you know what happened to him? That led to his own destruction. When you become disappointed with God, and that then leads to despising God, you're well down the road to self-destruction, as this man Judas. In fact, in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, he says something to this effect, Father, of those that you've given me, I've lost none except for, he calls him, the son of perdition. You know what the word perdition means? Waste. He's the son of waste. He says Mary wasted the ointment. But he himself is a waste. God gives him that moniker. God names him the son of perdition. The son of waste. The third individual at this meal where you have a contrast between worship and waste, is Jesus. We pick it up in Matthew 26, verse 10. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, whoso, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for um, a memory, a memorial of her. What did Jesus do? Judas led the disciples to say, indignantly, what a waste! Jesus immediately came to the defense of this woman and protected her. And he rebuked Judas, and he rebuked the twelve disciples, and he actually praised her for that waste. Because really, nothing that you and I can ever give to Jesus should be considered waste. In fact, we should be willing to waste, so to speak, everything for Jesus. Never miss an opportunity to waste yourself and to waste all that you have on the worthy Lord Jesus in true worship. True worship is never a waste. True worship is the most valuable thing in God's eyes. There is not anything else that I can see in the scripture that God is seeking from human beings beside their worship. The Father seeketh such to worship Him in spirit and in truth. True worship is what God is seeking from human beings because actually that is exactly what you and I are made for. We all have different jobs, different vocations, different likes and dislikes, but the fact of the matter is Ultimately, you and I, if we are breathing human beings, we are here because God made us for His worship. It pleased Him that we would worship Him. It's never a waste. He's looking for true worship. And true worship is, as is described in the, the book of Hebrews, it's that worship that is a result of having your, your hearts and your consciences purified, not with the blood of bulls and goats like in the Mosaic Covenant, but with the precious blood of Jesus that can actually deal with inner guilt and sin and bring forgiveness. Well, that's the first deal in the meal. The second one, we pick it up in verse 17, and this is a contrast between what I call faithfulness and faith uh, and falseness faithfulness and falseness look at verse 17 as we continue here now the first day uh, the, the first day of the feast of unleavened bread which was just a, a kind of an umbrella term for uh, well, Passover is an umbrella term but the first day of, uh, of the feast of unleavened bread the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man 
and say unto him, The Master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And here it unfolds. The second meal. It's a Seder. It's a Passover Seder. It's a Passover meal. And uh, it, it becomes, this meal becomes the great revealer of who is a believer. It separates the men from the boys, so to speak. It separates the true from the false. So I call it faithfulness versus falseness. Because this Passover Seder meal is the great revealer of who is a true believer. Let's look at it. In, those, in the verses that I've already read, the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready for the Passover, verse 19 says. There's the, the, the Passover prepping. There's the Passover preparation. And in other passages, it's very clear two were sent. Peter and John were sent into uh, Jerusalem, and they were to follow a man that was carrying a water, a pit, uh, 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 a pitcher of water. They were to follow him to his house. And uh, he would lead them to the upper room in his house where the Seder could be uh, practiced. But just think for a moment. The Lord had this all worked out. He didn't communicate with that man. This was a divine moment. And I hope we understand that perhaps we don't even recognize them, but we come across divine moments where God has things set up, and we can't afford to miss these times. You know what I do? I, I write down, and I keep record of, and I try to keep uh, 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 mindful of the, of the times when God has just worked out things providentially, and it really was a divine moment. God was so in this. This was a... An instance of that, that man. And they went, as Jesus said, they prepared for the Seder, which would mean they would have to purchase a lamb. They would have to kill that lamb in the temple court. They would have to then have the priest sprinkle that blood on the altar. They would then have to take the remains of that lamb and roast the whole lamb in preparation for the, the Seder meal. Look at verse 20 as we pick it up. Now, when the even was come, he, Jesus, sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and they began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it was written of him, but woe unto him, a woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas said, which of course would betray him, Master, is it I? And he said, Thou hast said. So there's preparation. And here's a declaration that Jesus, during the Seder meal, makes this declaration. One of you is going to betray me. One of you twelve is going to, you're going to turn me in to the authorities. You're going to betray me. And so all 12 of them ask what is really a rhetorical question. Lord, is it I? And they're expecting him to say, no, it's not you. And the meal goes from joyfulness to real somberness and sorrow. This meal, the Passover, it's a time for deep fellowship. Remember I said they're sitting on the floor, they're sitting on a pillow, they're leaning to their left. Judas is in the place of honor. He's sitting here, Jesus is leaning towards Judas. Judas is here on Jesus' left. John is on the other side, he's leaning toward Jesus. That's why it says that, Jesus, that John leaned on Jesus' breast. He was leaning towards Jesus. Jesus was leaning toward Judas. Isn't that interesting? And the Lord also honored Judas by giving him the piece, the piece of matzah as the host. That would be uh, an honorable thing. So he's showing him gracious hospitality. And the fact that Judas takes it as the betrayer is really a sign of evil treachery. And after he took that, uh, that piece of matzah, the Bible says in John chapter 13 that Judas got up 
And he left the table. And he went out into the night. And the other, the other 11 disciples had no clue. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know that, Jewish was, uh, that Judas was the betrayer. They didn't realize that. But he knew he was. Jesus knew who he was and what he was up to. But he left the table. He didn't partake in the special institution that we're going to see here in a moment after that declaration was made. He did not partake of that which Jesus instituted for us what we call the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, in verses 26 to 29. He was already gone by then. But mind you, before that, Jesus had washed his feet. Jesus had washed that betrayer's feet. That's something. Gave him all the opportunity that man could have ever had for three and a half years, right up to the end. Verse 26, right here, after they had finished the meal, look at what happens. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Obviously, if he was standing right there, that bread wasn't his body. His body, he was standing there in it. What he was saying, this bread represents my body. It's all he was saying. This bread symbolizes my body. So, he says, take, eat, and then about the cup. As they were, uh, he, he took the cup, verse 27, he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it. Take, eat, drink ye all of it. In other words, here's a directive. All of you eat together from the same piece of matzah, and all of you drink together out of the same cup of wine. That's not maybe protocol for COVID. My mother grew up in a, in a I, I, I won't even call it a domination, they would not al allow that to be called it. My mom grew up in a group of, uh, of believers in which when they, they had uh, the Lord's Supper every Sunday. And they did it early. They did it like 8.30 in the morning, and only believers showed up for it. And they all drank out of the same cup. I remember just observing and seeing the slobber around the top of the cup. But anyway, that's what's going on here. They, they ate from the same pizza matzah. They drank out of the same cup together. What does that symbolize? Symbolize a oneness. A oneness with this one that says this bread represents my body that is about to be broken, that is about to be pierced, and this cup represents my blood that is about to be shed and poured out, my life poured out, a oneness with that. There's doctrine here. He goes on to say in the 26th verse, uh, he says, uh, actually verse uh, 28, this blood is the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission or the forgiveness of sin. This is my body, this is my blood. He's saying, this cup represents the blood that I am about to shed that is going to ratify a new covenant, New Testament or new covenant. In the book of uh, Hebrews, listen to this, I'm going to read this very quick. Hebrews chapter 8, this is the covenant uh, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then there should be no place sought for a second covenant. You know what was wrong with the first covenant? No one could keep it. That's why it was not faultless. No one could live up to it. He goes on to say, for finding fault with them, not with the covenant, but finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, he quotes from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. 
I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. That's the old covenant made through Moses. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. They broke it. So I'm making a new covenant with them. This is it, verse 10. The covenant that I'm going to make with them is that I will put my law into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, and I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. This, is the, this cup represents the blood that will ratify a new covenant that will bring about forgiveness of sin. That's what he's saying. And whenever a covenant was made in ancient times, it required the death of an animal. It required the blood to be shed by that animal. It was a blood covenant. Death had to take place. And Jesus is saying, it's not going to be the blood of a lamb. It's not going to be the blood of a bull or a goat. It's going to be my blood. I'm going as the lamb of God. The covenant that is going to be cut is going to be me being cut. Me being pierced. My blood being shed. I'm going to ratify this new covenant not with animal blood, but with my blood. I think it's Acts chapter 20 tells us that that blood is the blood of God. And it was. And it is. And then look at verse 29. I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's talking about that kingdom that he mentioned would follow his second coming. That glorious kingdom, that kingdom that we sometimes call the millennium, that 1,000-year kingdom that God promised to the Jewish people, that, he says, is when I will once again drink of this fruit of the vine. So, until the kingdom, there's no fellowship with the nation of Israel. That's when the fellowship, that's when the party begins, you might say. When the kingdom is established at his second coming, that's when the feasting begins with Israel again. That's when they're restored. And that's when there's joy. And that's when they drink together, not with sorrow, but with great joy. And we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26 that these two parts of the Passover Seder, the broken bread and the cup, that those that Jesus said represent his body and his blood, that we are to partake of those whenever, as often as we see fit to. But whenever we do, we should keep doing this until he comes. So Israel, it'll be done when he sets up his kingdom. He'll then sit down and they'll drink together out of that cup. Us, we drink the cup that symbolizes and we continue it until we see him face to face, until he come. That's the duration of it. And then the conclusion in the, in the 30th verse, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives probably... It was all or part of the traditional Passover halal, which is Psalm 115 to 118. But the thing that I wanted to mention was this. My wife and I spent almost 15 years in Connecticut before we came here to Brooklyn. Two of the most well-known names linked to the American Revolution were Connecticut Yankees. Benedict Arnold, he was born in Norwich, Connecticut. We ministered about five miles from Norwich, Connecticut. The other guy, Nathan Hale. He came, he hailed from Coventry, Connecticut. In fact, we visited the, the Nathan Hale homestead there 
And what's fascinating about it, in one of the upstairs bedroom, there is a silhouette that he did of himself on the door, still there. These two men, both from Connecticut, but uh, two lives, probably no greater contrast than them. One turned out to be, as you know, a notorious traitor, and the other a brave hero. Benedict Arnold distinguished himself early on the battlefield as a, a very fearless and, and really a genius military strategist who, because of his ambition, failed to follow orders carefully and went well beyond what he was told to do in order to secure a victory, and as a result, he lost promotion. His first wife died, and Arnold married uh, another wife, and his second wife was a British loyalist. And as a result, she put him in touch with British commanders who later he sided with. And he betrayed the Americans. And at the end of the war, he had to move to England in order to live out the rest of his life. Nathan Hale entered the Revolutionary Army at 20 years of age in 1775 as a first lieutenant. By the way, he went to Yale College at 14 years of age and graduated at 18. He went in as a first lieutenant into the Revolutionary Army and uh, on September 8, 1776, he volunteered to be a spy to investigate the British troop movements right here in New York City. Two weeks later, he was caught by British forces, and he was brought to the nearby headquarters of the British General William Howe. He, it was discovered that uh, he had papers on him that implicated him as a spy, and so he's immediately sentenced to death by hanging. He requested a Bible and was denied that request. He requested that uh, a clergyman, a minister, visit him. He was denied that request. And the next morning, on the morning of September 22, 1776, he was marched along the post road to the park of the artillery, which is next to the Dove Tavern, which today is 66th and 3rd Ave. And he was hanged, 21 years of age. He was hanged. From the memoirs of Captain William Hall, Captain Hale entered. He was calm. He bore himself with gentle dignity. In the consciousness of rectitude and high intentions, he asked for writing materials which Hall said I furnished him, he wrote two letters, one to his mother and one to a brother officer. He was shortly after summoned to the gallows, but a few persons were around him, yet his dying words were remembered. Remember what they were? I regret that I only have what? One life, one life to lose for my country. Not... What a waste! He's only 21 years old. What a waste of my life. No, but what a privilege to die for my country. How does that compare to believers who are citizens of a heavenly country? Spiritually, ask yourself, am I a Benedict Arnold or I'm a Nathan Hale? You claim to be a follower of the Lord Jesus, but do you deny the Lord by committing adultery with this world? Because the Bible says, if any believer is a friend of this world, he's an enemy of God, and uh, that you are guilty of spiritual adultery. A Benedict Arnold. Have you ever made your choice to break the alabaster box? The alabaster box is your life. The contents of your life. 
poured out, wasted if you will, in absolute surrender, pouring out your life in total allegiance to the Lord Jesus. Are you holding back on the Lord? Are you hoarding that precious ointment of your life? I beseech you, based upon the mercies of God bestowed upon you, that you break the alabaster box and pour out your life as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Are you a Benedict Arnold or a Nathan Hale spiritually? Are you a Mary breaking the alabaster box or are you a Judas doing your own thing and betraying the very Lord that you say is your Savior? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the example that we have in the Scripture of these two contrasts. Oh, Lord, make us worshipers that are willing to waste our lives as the world would see it, and even some Christians that are unspiritual see it as a waste. And yet, Lord, you see it as a precious ointment when we lay our lives on the altar of absolute surrender. Lord, deliver us from attitudes and actions that constitute betrayal of the precious Lord Jesus that willingly gave his body to be struck and to be pierced and to be smitten and his blood to be freely poured out gave his life that we might have life eternal that we might have the remission the forgiveness of sin Oh, Lord, make us spiritual wasters in the sense that Mary was accused. May we suffer that same accusation. May we waste ourselves, so to speak, on the worthy one, the Lord Jesus. May we be willing to be poured out in total for you and you alone. May we not reserve anything for ourselves. May we be all yours to the very last drop poured out for you. You're worthy of so much more. May we at least give you what we are in Jesus' name. Amen.